Carl Sagan, the great communicator, said it best. The Earth is nothing but a moat of dust floating on a sunbeam. Today, we'll jump right in and discover the three ways that dust plays a role in your life in ways you never knew. And the third one will absolutely blow you away. Let's go. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Shakespeare, the bard, had a way with words. In Hamlet, the protagonist asked the question to me, what is the quintessence of dust? I'm no Shakespearean actor, but that is powerful. Human beings are made of dust, and today we're gonna explore the three major ways that dust plays a role in your life and even in your body itself. Before we get into the three vital ways that dust plays a role in your life, clean off the dust on your index finger and click the thumbs up button. I bet you're thinking that dust only bothers you. It only gets on the cover of dust jackets. It only follows your toddler around as she makes her way throughout the house. It gets in the back of your car and people write on it, wash me. What a pain. Our universe is filled with exotic minutia, tiny particles, elementary, composite, forces and fields that make up the cosmos. On this channel, we've explored the dynamics of these lightest seen particles like neutrinos, all the way to dark matter particles that we have not yet seen and don't know for sure even if they exist. We've explored the perpetual nuclear explosions that we call stars, how they light up the cosmos and sometimes in a violent fireworks display become supernovae that scatter their detritus throughout the cosmos. And without that very process, we wouldn't be here explaining the properties of dust. We live in a vast and mysterious universe. Without dust, you wouldn't be here. We all wouldn't be here. We live on a rocky planet, which the famous communicator Carl Sagan called a pale blue dot. In this image, commanded by him, made by the Voyager 1 spacecraft on Valentine's Day, 1990. The very planet that we're sitting on and floating through space on is a giant rock, which is basically a giant dust grain the byproducts of carbon, nitrogen, silicon, and the molecules made of them clumping together to make an enormous ball. But it goes deeper, literally into your veins. The second way that dust affects your life is that the hemoglobin molecule in your blood gives it the red color, which then when deoxygenated becomes blue, is reliant on the capture of an iron atom. That iron atom came from the supernova that produced the material that the planet is made of, and in particular made the iron core that we've discussed in this video, produces no net energy. It's an endothermic reaction that doesn't allow the nuclear fusion process to keep on occurring. The third way that dust affects you is that it obscures our view of the cosmos, making it seem that our galaxy and even the universe is somehow centered on us. We've explored that in the great debate videos, and it may play a role in the eventual ability or inability of cosmologists like my colleagues in the Simons Observatory, it may limit our ability to glimpse the very aftershocks of the Big Bang itself, which we call the inflationary universe. Dust is truly the quintessence of our existence. We've known about dust in the cosmos for ages, as far back as the ancient Incan astronomers of South America, who at the time saw not the luminous dots of light that we use as constellations, they used the dark nebulae comprised primarily of dust as their fortune-telling objects. These astronomical devices in their zodiac are very different from ours. You have features like a rat, a camel, a llama, and even my favorite zodiac sign, the umbilicus of the llama. What's your sign? And they weren't far off in ascribing lifelike properties to the dark, dusty globules. And that's because dust is the substance of which our cosmos is formed. We also have seen brilliant displays, no pun intended, of dark, dusty columns in this image taken from the James Webb Space Telescope just this year of the Pillars of Creation, a giant nebula harboring perhaps trillions of planetary fragments within it. The universe teems with dust, and that dust could be vital as Christian Tadu have called it, but it isn't always easy to see. Actually, most of the time, dust is hard to see. It's faint, it obscures, it blocks, and it prevents light coming from elsewhere. For centuries, it was seen as a cosmic nuisance, getting in the way of distant celestial targets, dimming their light, making it more red, and also causing it to become polarized. Dust is the foundation of our universe. 
literally the foundation of our planet. What starts as tiny dust grains gathers together in what's called protoplanetary accretion, forming a protoplanetary disk. In this disk, tiny bits of rock and ice clump together, making so-called planetesimals. These can be just a few meters to kilometers in width. When they get big enough, they gather more mass and they get packed tighter and tighter, warming up. And in fact, the core of our Earth can also be molten because of the incredible pressure of tens of trillions of kilograms worth of matter compacted into a relatively small, less than 10,000 kilometer radius ball that we call our home planet. There are at least as many planets in the Milky Way as there are stars. Some solar systems, like the TRAPPIST-1 system, even have a multitude of planets very close to our Earth, existing in what's called the habitable zone, where water can be in liquid form, and they exist in a region close enough to the host star of that stellar system that they could harbor life in liquid oceans. In the grand context of the universe, planets like ours are really a dime a dozen, like dust. But again, just like dust, that doesn't make it insignificant. Until recently, cosmic dust was nothing more than a cosmic dirty windshield obscuring and blocking our view of the stars. But it's always been a chimerical challenge for astronomers to deal with. And now we've turned our attention to dust itself. And some people's entire astronomical careers are built on the study of dust. And that has a long tradition dating back to the original astronomer, Galileo. He was deceived by dusty delusions. He saw the Pleiades asterisk as a cloud that was actually, in his mind, comprised of innumerable stars. He convinced himself that if he had a big enough telescope, he could resolve those cloudy, blurry blotches into individual resolved stars. But he can't, because that is a reflection nebula that surrounds the Pleiades. As shown here, the star Merope in the lower left quadrant of the Pleiades as you view it on the sky, is a reflection nebula comprised primarily of carbon nanoparticles that act like little mirrors. And by studying the spectrum of the dust, comparing it to the host star, the star nearby, Merope, astronomers saw that they had exactly the same spectral behavior. The dust was acting like little mirrors, merely just reflecting the light from the star, not producing light, and not behaving like little stars themselves either. A century or so later, William Herschel and his sister Caroline identified the disk-like shape of our galaxy using dust. And thanks to how easily it can block what's behind it, he was duped into thinking our sun was actually near the center of the galaxy. Which was ironic given that Galileo had figuratively displaced the Earth from being the center of the universe to merely the third dust devil from the sun. Then, in the 1900s, came Harlow Shapley, who thought the Milky Way was far bigger than it actually was, thanks to dust. He was deceived by the dim appearance of distant stars and globular clusters, thinking that their dimness was due to their distance falling off as the inverse square law, when actually it was dust in our galaxy that dimmed the light and the stars that he was looking at were actually much closer. It turned out by using the positions of globular clusters and triangulating their positions, we could see where the center of the Milky Way's mass and therefore its star concentration was highest, and that the Earth was actually located orbiting around the Sun some two-thirds of the way out on one of the many spiral arms of the Milky Way galaxy, each one of which has tremendous amounts of dust within it. And now dust is impacting our view of the cosmos at its earliest phases, not because dust was created back at the origin of the universe, but because dust can obscure it. And that's the third way that dust impacts our understanding of the universe. You've heard many times on this channel the concept of the multiverse. In many interviews ranging from Will Kinney to opponents of the multiverse in conversations with Neil Turok. The question is, how can we observe the presence of the multiverse? Some say if we detect inflationary generated B-mode polarization from primordial gravitational waves that suffuse the cosmos, we would have indirect evidence for a multiverse. In fact, that was the very claim back in 2014 when the BICEP2 experiment that I participated in and is the subject of my first book, Losing the Nobel Prize. That instrument, using detectors just like this, these are superconducting transition edge sensor bolometers whose resistance changes as they're cooled down or warmed up by microwave background radiation. And they're polarized too, just like cosmic polarizing sunglasses in front of each detector. This array and three others like it were cooled down to near absolute zero. Using this instrument, we claimed that we had glimpsed the spark that ignited the Big Bang, the so-called inflationary epoch. Our standard model of the Big Bang has gaps in it, lacunae 
that incorporates the creation of the universe all the way evolving till today. We've talked about inflation as a candidate model for such an inciting incident. And there are many astronomers believe that inflation is the only way in which the universe could have started. And concomitant with inflation comes the multiverse. So to glimpse evidence for the multiverse, we have to contend with obscuring signals like dust. For example, as described in Losing the Nobel Prize, less than a year after Bicep 2's historic announcement, on March 17, 2014, we made an announcement at Harvard Center for Astrophysics claiming that we had detected B-mode polarization, the smoking gun evidence for inflation. In early 2015, working alongside the Planck satellite team, we were able to demonstrate we had made a mistake. We had not made a detection of the faint B-mode polarization produced by inflationary generated gravitational waves. Instead, we detected non-primordial but astrophysical galactic grains of dust, which mimicked the B-mode polarization signal to a T. We were deceived and duped by dusty delusions. We didn't make a blunder, we didn't leave the lens cap on the telescope, and in fact the instrument continues in a fourth incarnation called Bicep Array, which is making the world leading measurements of the B-mode polarization signal. So we're still on the hunt for this, if we can get past the dust. So we need to do two experiments. Dust is what's called a systematic contaminant. It's an error in the system, the system being the telescope plus the Earth plus our cosmic location within the dusty spiral arms of the Milky Way galaxy. We have to do a separate experiment to get rid of systematic errors. We can't just keep measuring the same thing over and over again and getting smaller and smaller error bars. We have to dedicate a separate experiment or a component of the existing experiment just to looking at dust. So what we measured are the total signal S is equal to the cosmic signal C plus the dust signal, which is astrophysical but not cosmological. We measure the total signal and then with a separate component of the experiment, in this case, a high frequency channel of the instrument using the same type of detector system, we can look only at the dusty detritus. And then we can subtract a very high precision measurement of D from the signal that we measured above, leaving us just with the cosmic signal C. And that should have the closest approximation to the true amount of primordial gravitational wave energy as we can measure. We're doing that with the Simons Observatory and the Bicep Array team is doing it as well. So just as much as cosmic dust creates, it destroys. It can deceive. It can delude us into seeing what we want to see. Dust throughout all of modern astronomy has been the Janus face spoiler, and savior, creator, and concealer, the founder and flummoxer of astronomical aspirations. It's central to the cycles of the cosmos. It flows through all of our veins. And understanding and accounting for dust is at the forefront of cosmology and astrophysics today. So with a dose of what Mahatma Gandhi called humility, cosmic humility, the seeker after truth must be humbler than the dust, seeing that the dust could crush him rather than walking on it and crushing dust as most of us do in our daily lives. Astronomers of the future can deal with dust respecting it and having the requisite humility. If you'd like to learn more about the cutting edge search for inflation, click here and I'll see you in the next video.